sorry it took this long. Today, I have got the guy that got me into the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He's got the poster in the back. I've got the poster in the back as well as all of yeah. this stuff that my wife calls a sickness. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles original <laughs> writer, Bobby fucking Herbeck. Bobby, how are you? Can you fucking dig it? That is so great. Man, Man. Uh, I'm better now. I'm sorry we didn't hook up so much earlier as we just talked before we started rolling here it, it's, just, it's perfectly fine everything happens here that evaporate. but you know what it's not over because here's what i'm doing this morning and and i, I if i haven't all circled well I, i'm with you now i'm starting a campaign because we have so many people come to us fan, our, our, our fan base you know is on instagram that's where it is everybody whether i'm out in the street whether i'm at some function or i get up and talk or I, i'm a celebrity by the boom it's always do a reboot yeah i mean i had it in the target store the other day yeah. i'll get it in the grocery store the minute they find out i'm the ninja turtle they, they say the ninja turtle guy but i said no no the ninja turtle guys are eastman and laird i'm just part of a puzzle yeah <laughs> but i'm starting a campaign and, and some guy already just sent me an email um uh, Oh, the, the, the um, TMT Minute guys. Yeah, those are fantastic. Those guys are cool. Guys, they said, hey, we got to do this, man, and, and we'll do pins, a campaign to get you guys to reboot. And I said, we just need to knock Viacom's door down with it and say, hey, because Seth Rogen's doing an animated one. People don't want to see. We want to see what the first movie, this is what I get. Make that movie again or make a variation of it, but get Brian Henson back. Everybody's here. You know, pretty much, you yeah. know, they can do it. All the turtle guys are here. Those guys are cool. Did you see our May 23rd show we did, the, the pizza party? Yeah. I, it was I, great, to, it when was I, great to see everybody. When I started out doing this podcast, uh, like I told you before, my original goal was to have everybody. You guys are essentially what all of, the, I mean, if you look at my arm, I mean, it's nothing <laughs> but <Ninja> turtles <laughs> on my arm, right? Okay. You guys essentially started my fan it wasn't the 87 cartoon no matter how much i fondly love it i had two vhs's and i've told this numerous times on these podcasts i'm sorry if you guys are hearing this story again but i'm fucking sitting here with bobby herbeck and i don't care if you hear her one more time <laughs> i had two two vhs's when i was a little kid the first ninja turtle movie that poster sitting right behind you and that poster sitting right behind me and dumb and dumber I burn out Ninja Turtles three times and my mom bought it every single time. She would not buy me Dumb and Dumber because she was so tired of hearing Jim Carrey's most annoying sound in the world. Yes. Not, she would not buy it again. So you guys are the reason for all of this oh, turtle man. stuff, you know, and if it wouldn't have you're, been for hey, you. Hey, dude, you're, you're the reason that we're, we're here 30 years later and getting this love and this, this, this uh, to the point of blushing praise and stuff and people come up and say man you changed my life what you said to me earlier you know and you go wow I say in a I hope in a good way oh yeah man you, and I'm talking about Justin Turner third baseman for the Dodgers mm -hmm. I'm talking about a bunch of major league ball players and football players and these guys were all your age when this movie came out yeah. And JT comes up to me at the Dodger game and I'm in the dugout and he said dude and he looks around and he says I still have my Ninja Turtle PJs, man. That's how much I love this. And I gave him a poster and the equipment guy framed it for him. You'd have thought I gave him an MVP award. He's a big turtle fan. So I cowabunga him. I went to the series in Dallas. I just to bring him love. I didn't bring him the COVID. I don't know where he got that, but hell, that's right. Let me get this. That's running around. So I was on the air here locally in Phoenix the other morning when they brought me on on the air. I had this on my face. That's fantastic. Okay. The guy starts laughing, and the host, and he says, man, it's been 30 years. Yes, you tell me. Now look what I look like, I said. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so much love. It's cool. You know, yeah, we, and we're going to do a documentary, which you know. Yeah. And we're going to try to do a coffee table book or what I call a potty book, a little paperback thing where you can just spend five minutes, you know, okay, I'll finish, do that tomorrow. Yeah. But I want to get the reboot done, and the year is not over. We're still going to celebrate the 30th till December, th in, till January 1. We're celebrating the 30th anniversary. That's fantastic. It, it does not like this. I think what holds up so much, and, and I want to see the Henson company get back involved because we've had so many iterations, whether it be animated or the live action, where they put the little green dots all over somebody, and none of them has held up 
quite like this first one. You know, from Steve Barron's direction to John Dupre's, uh, just his composing for this Maybe. stuff. It is essentially, in my opinion, and like I said, I'm extremely biased with all this turtle shit around me. It is the perfect and the creme, it, the cream rises to the top and nothing rises higher than this yeah. movie is essentially what I'm getting at. Yeah. Um, when you started, and I've, I went back and watched almost everything you guys have done with you and Kim, or if you've been on any kind of talk show, I try to ask you guys different stuff. So you're not, you know, right. rehabs, rehash the same stuff. So we'll go over a lot of the same stuff, and I'm hoping it'll be fresh. Um, when you got this idea from Kim, he's like, they wanted to hire you working at Golden Harvest. What movie were you working on at Golden Harvest when you got the... Working, uh, working on a comedy. They wanted to do a comedy, you know, that Gold Harvest, if people don't know, is out of Hong Kong, Raymond Chow's company. So their their claim to fame was the uh, first of Bruce Lee movies, then the Jackie Chan. And then mm -hmm. that's why Ninja Turtles seemed an easy fit, but it took forever to get Tom Gray and Raymond Chow to even listen to this. He, Tom would go, quit bugging me with this Ninja and Pinjin thing and finish Department Store. It's called Department Store. Yeah. No, it never saw the light of day on the screen. And someone asked me the other day, what's the difference between when you wrote for TV, Different Strokes and Jeffersons and those shows? And I said, the difference was when you wrote a, a, one of those uh, episodes, it mm -hmm. was going to be on within two weeks. Yeah. Uh, and you write, I got a film at Columbia right now that's in development. I may not live to see that hit the screen. You, there's never a guarantee. Even though you get the dough for the show, doesn't mean it's going to make the screen, you know. And, and today, the only saving grace, there's such a, 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 a insatiable appetite for content right now. And there's so many outlets. It, it's I tell people it's like pouring a, uh, some rubbing alcohol in the street here in Arizona in July. Well, actually, most of the year this year, but it's <laughs> gone. So, you know uh the, the, it just it was something that it's always been, i don't know what kim told you but this has always been a project that wasn't going to happen we just yeah. kept having you know like those strips they put when they're chasing a the car like somebody put those strips in front of us everywhere we turn even in the middle of shooting the movie me yeah. in the middle of, i was in london writing the picture and tom gray my boss says herbs go do something for 10 days we have some problems well, what it was is they uh, some people to pull money off the table. Fox had pulled money off the table for the pictures, so he had to go find money, which he got from New Line eventually. So I went to Paris for 10 days and met my bud there and had a ball, so it wasn't wasted. It's I, fun writing. I, I, <laughs> Not I what I set out to be. Well, when, uh, when I was listening to your interviews, uh, you, you had said that you had wrote a lot of this stuff over at uh, Steve Barron's cottage, and it was haunted. Um, oh. I, wanted, I wanted to bring that up again because I don't like ghost stories, however listening to you talk about a haunted place was fantastic could you could you retell that and story I am, listen i'm in a foreign country <laughs> uh before you were born it was a very scary movie with dustin hoffman and beautiful Susanna york called straw dogs it was really scary about a little village like i was in out in the in the tulies in in england and, and it was I think it was called coxwall and uh which has another connotation actually but <laughs> It's, it's on the Thames and on the other side, Marlow was the big town. So I had, I was in London writing, but I had been there before several times. I knew a bunch of people. I was single and I was partying this and that and I go, I'm not getting this shit. I'm just not getting this shit done. <laughs> and then Steve said, you want to, hey love, would you like to come out to me place over the weekend and you know, get away from it? I said, sure. And I go out there and I, I, after the weekend, I said, you know, Steve, we were having dinner at night before we had Max. You know, I think I should, come back out here and write this movie he said really love there's nothing to do here I said exactly so come back go out there write boom I'm there and so one night in particular first of all I'd walk in this was a really I can't tell you how small this town was how small was it Bobby <laughs> <laughs> this town was so freaking small it was probably the opening crowd that was uh, the people you see in an NFL game right now how many fans you've seen an NFL game so anyway I'm walking in one day and I could see people looking out the curtains or the windows and I heard someone go, it's the bloody yank. And I'm going, oh, Jesus. And you, when they would correct you, if you go, where's the post office? They go, oh, you mean the post, you know? So anyway, back to the ghost. So I'm staying there and I go to bed at night and he had these little spiral metal staircase up to his, up to the bedrooms. I'm in bed and I hear like clanging. What the hell is that? You know, go to sleep. Next night, a little noise here, a little noise there. 
And then the, the ultimate night was a night that I'm downstairs, I'm at a desk, turn my SE30 Apple computer off, if you know what those are, before your time. They, they ever dig them up in an archaeology thing, they're going to go, what are these things? TVs? So turn it off. Lights off, lights up, lights out. Get to the, go to the stairs, turn the light off, up the spiral stair, get in bed, turn the light off. I'm asleep and something wakes me up about three in the morning, just some kind of a shuffling noise. And I open my eyes and I can see down the stairwell, the spiral stairwell, I see a light shining and I go, what the hell is that? I turn the lights off. I go down, kitchen lights on. Now I go around the corner into my where I'm writing and my computer's on. And I'm going, Steve, hello, love, are you here, Steve? Nothing. I was so freaked out, I went and slept in the car that night. I was. I got a hold of Steve the next day. I said, did you come out and then leave? He said, no, love. I said, there's a buddy ghost. He said, well, you know, you know, love, the house is for over 400 years old. I says, oh, so that makes it ghostable, I guess, huh? But that's a true story. And I don't believe in this stuff. I don't believe in all the alien thing. I don't believe in any of that stuff, but I'm not going to discount what I, what happened in England. In maybe India, it was a good ghost. Maybe it was a good feng shui coming in. Maybe is, he put uh, his hand on the computer. And now came a good movie. Is, is any, is any of that. So they say life imitates art or people take stuff from life and they put it into their artwork. Did <laughs> any of that kind of, did any of your stay make it into the script that you were working on? When you were staying at Steve Barron's house or his cottage, excuse me. Stay. The only thing in that, the only thing that besides Steve's input, and then I got to go over the creature shop a few times when they were, you know, clay modeling the turtles. And then next step, and that was so cool. And a few tips there about things, you know, to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't say ghosts or anything. No, because this, to me, this is purely American. He, I wasn't even thinking outside. I wasn't even thinking international. I was just hoping this would be hitting America. And as you probably know, which we found out maybe a year or so ago, this movie, that first movie, they did not uh, take that movie to show in Asia. We thought we were making a mockery of, of martial arts and of yeah. their culture. And it was not even the second one, yes. But the first one, and, and China wasn't in the game then. Yeah. You know, so it, it, it we did 190, think Kim said the 193 million, 195 million, which would I guess be like 300 today. Yeah. Excluding yeah, Asia, it's pretty good numbers. It's fantastic numbers, especially for an exclusive, exclusively an independent film. I mean, for the longest time, you guys were the highest, right. uh, highest grossing independent film in the world. Yeah, um, and a film that was panned by every critic, except for this guy, uh, oh, really nice guy we're working with, Rice. His last name is Rice. He's a he's a reporter out of New York. That he's he moderated. Um, we did the Hawaii Comic Con virtual. He moderated. He's great. He's a great guy. He's everything ninja. Yeah. Rick Rick. No, not Rick West. I'll send you his name. You might be interested. You might have heard of him. He's done a bunch of books, but he's they even go to him to consult about what a ninja would do in this particular thing. Yeah, he's yeah. a fascinating guy. If nothing else, I'd love to have him on just to sit here and talk ninjas. Yeah, and yeah. No, you'd love this guy. He's really, really interesting. Well, I'll I hook you up. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, I asked my kid, I got a 10-year-old kid, and uh, I asked him the other day, you know, what he wanted to be when he was older. And for the last couple of years, he's been kicking around three ideas, and he's kind of combined them. You know, he said one time he wanted to be a ninja. Now it's evolved into I want to, you know, swim with sharks type of things and then, you know, get and work with them. And then now he wants to be a ninja that teaches karate. That's also an excavator for dinosaur bones. And he gets to swim with sharks. <laughs> so he's kind of trying to take a little bit from each. He's that, that poo poo plat. He's trying to take a little bit from each thing and just collectively put it into something. You mean like, as in Hawaii poo poo? <laughs> yeah. no. Oh, he's 10. That's all right. 10 yeah. works. Yeah. So, I love all the stuff you have, man. This is amazing. Oh, thank hey, you. you. Know, do you know the NECA guys? Uh, well, I'll, here, give me one second because that's. Uh, those guys know. sent me some stuff and shame on me. Is it Rick? What's that? Is his name Rick? Who's who? who? At NECA. Oh, I'm not sure. I've, I've tried reaching out to them. They don't really, uh, they haven't really reached back. Uh, but they're very, they're so nice, man. They're Splinter. But I would Oh, yeah. It's a little, it's a little convoluted in here. I got rafts somewhere around here. He's Is my that friend. NECA? Oh, yeah. These are the, uh, 
the 90s ones that came out from their scale mm-hmm. and their buds. Oh, look, look how good those are. They're, these are, NECA, if you're listening, I want to have you guys on. They are the fantastic toys. Hey, to again, the- I will hook you up. Uh, thanks, brother. I appreciate we, it. They, they've been great to us. They, they sent us four figures. No, they just came out with four of the, the four turtles. And I, I, I tell people when they say, you know, I, you know, the, the, like just uh, JT, uh, J, Justin Turner say, you know, I still have my, you know, this and that from turtles. I said, don't lose it. Hang on to it. Because <laughs> I saw a thing where if you have some figures from 1990, they're worth five grand. You know, I mean, there's some dough on these yeah. things now. Oh yeah, they're, they've, they've got some legs on them. There's there's quite a few of them that have uh, that have went up there, and then a lot of them, if they're loose like this, most of the time they lose value. But there's a few toys out there from that '87 Playmates line um, that that are going for quite a few grand, uh, just off box and you know off card. Um, Listen, 30 years. I, I hate to repeat myself, but 30 years, nobody. I, I and we say it on these interviews. Had no idea in 30 years they didn't even give it a thought that we'd be 30 years later down the road and, and this thing has become part of the fat social fabric. It's not going to go away. What, what, what goes through your head when you really sit here, like you sit back in your chair like this, right? And you sit here and think about the Ninja Turtles that you're wearing on your shirt and on your head and Leo behind you and that poster behind you. What goes through your mind when you sit here and think, shit, I was a part of something 30 years ago that still have people coming up to me asking me stuff i mean what 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 thought process or what comes to mind when you sit there and think about it yeah what i think about it is and i'm serious and i i've said it all through this year i said it on the pizza party i didn't get to say a lot because they they pretty much gave me a short haircut on that show but i said that we're blessed man just that we're blessed you know this is one of those things you know in 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 my business where if you get something that that is a hit like that and lasts yeah. this long and has this many sequels, you know, you're, you're not in the George Lucas area, but you're certainly uh, right, right outside the door as far as the, the, the mass audience and, and fan base that you build and continue to build. I mean, Star Wars is obviously building fan bases. Mm-hmm. And I think you heard me met Midas, if you've seen our interviews where I said, I, someone asked me about my writing process. And part of it was that I, looked at the first Star Wars and the second Star Wars and I studied the battles. There's a very famous, uh, George Lucas's godfather, unofficial godfather, a mentor was Joseph Campbell who wrote all the books on mythology. And uh, George Lucas to this day worships this man. And and I'm sorry I never met him, but I read his stuff too. And he's an amazing man. He set all the ground rules to how how you do this, these sorts of things, you know? And I watched those because of Campbell. And then I started noticing that each battle, every time there was a battle, there was a, it wasn't, gee, now we're eight minutes and we need a battle. Yeah. There was a reason, a motivation that led up to that battle. So I made sure to cut that out, design that in the first script that when it comes, came time for a showdown, there was a, a solid story, narr- narrative reason for that battle, if that makes sense. Yeah. It wasn't just, geez, we need to have some kicking some ass now, you know, go for it. And yeah, the beauty of the story, work. among other than Steve Barron, the beauty of the story is to have Shredder, uh, you know, and, and Splinter and Shredder go at it at the, at the end was yeah. just just the coup de grace. After he's given these boys all these lessons, right? Yeah. Then he kicks ass. And it's just like, and I had a lot of parents back when that movie came out coming up to me and saying, thank you so much. You know, and my one buddy, I lived in Long Beach until March. We moved back here. I'm, I'm in, I went to high school here in ASU. And but I had a buddy in Long Beach, he's a rugby guy. Long Beach is a big rugby city. And this big Stewie comes up at, at the at Long Beach Grand Prix and he comes up to me and says, Oh man, I took my kid to see your movie. And I, and I says, What are you, a big mook? And he's got Latin tears. I said, Look at you, you big mook crying. He says, Yeah, well, I've seen it. God was with the fireplace and the splinter appears and the, tells him just the uh, turtles, he loves them. And then my son took my hand, looked up and said, do you love me, dad? He's oh man, I can't even talk about this shit anymore. And he walks away and I said, you big baby. <laughs> you know, but it touched me. It really did. It touched me that this guy, this big mook was touched. I yeah. thought that was cool. That's you know, good. job well done. We did our assignment. I mean, anybody that, that steps out into um, entertainment world, they, like you said earlier, you, you're lucky if you get one. Let alone 
an entire just sequel after reboot, history. reboot after reboot. I mean, it, it just goes to show a test of time what Kevin and Peter did and what you guys took and evolved it. I mean, like I said at the beginning, I'm super biased, but this is hands down a perfect movie when it comes to the Turtles. Um, and knowing a little bit more with the Jason Campbell and everything had to have a reason. It's always nice too, because you see so many movies that are either just there for the money or it's just there for filler. Um, what was your favorite fight scene writing when you started doing this? Do you have one or is it just that splinter and shredder was just so much, just so great? Well, I really, I mean, I liked all of them, but I really liked, I liked the last one. I like where, where shredder just shows up can barely walk and says, I'll take it from here. Of course, I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. I got this boys. And yeah. he and, and Shredder go at it. Who James Sato, by the way, is one of the nicest people you would ever meet. Yeah. He's a wonderful man. And uh, Sato's son. Yeah. Uh, you know, but I liked all the little, you know, I, I studied, someone asked, one of, the, one of the interviewers asked a really good question a month or so ago. And it was, who did you think about when you wrote Turtle? I mean, any people in particular? And I said, yeah, it's a very good question. I said, the Marx Brothers mm -hmm. and the Four Musketeers, or Three Musketeers, depending on which one you watch. Um, and I said, it, it, they were the Marx Brothers to me as far as their little wise-ass comments, yeah. clever quips, you know? And, um, and I said, I, I always bear in mind there, when you look at the graphic comic book, they don't look like teenagers. Let's face it. They look like full blown adults past puberty. They're full ring. He might even have families. Okay. Yeah. And so I just wanted to keep in mind, they are teenagers. They're little wise asses. Mm -hmm. They're going to try to get away a little bit, a little bit of this. And, you know, and uh, anyway, that was all in my thought process. And I used the Marx brothers and the four musketeers. Because the four musketeers were very well written, they bounced off of each other. Yeah. Well, so that's that's a great that's a great thing to pull from. Um, you know, going back and and really looking at this, everything went together. There was nothing. Nobody had. Everybody had so much time to shine in just ninety six minutes. Well, however long, I can't remember how long. I think it says it on the movie poster. It might be like ninety three or ninety six minutes as far as runtime. It I might think be it's little, an um, You know, but it's it's a very. Yeah, I yeah, an hour 15, maybe. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's, I'm supposed to do it. I'm going to a screening tonight here, at, 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 uh, you know, and talk about the movie. Mm -hmm. And then two tomorrow. But I think they said the movie's an hour and 45. But that does that includes their trailers and stuff that yeah. they're showing. So, yeah, I think it's an hour and a half. A movie like this shouldn't be more than an hour and a half. You want to leave them wanting more anyway. Yeah. That, I mean, that's Even though that's, I write 300 pages. I, I mean, I got, I'm going to drop a name. I know Clint Eastwood very well. And, and I have a script that he liked. And when after he read it, and he, he you can never hardly ever hear when he talks, and he goes, "Hey, Shorty, I like the script, Shorty." But he, <laughs> he says it's a it's a little too heavy. Yeah. And I what do you mean it's too heavy? Too many pages. You're gonna have to make too many people. He would have he circled back with it just before he made the movie about the three soldiers on the train. They were looking for a project, and they came back to me about looking at that script again. But it just was too many people for him. It was it's a satire about the White House press corps, which to this day nobody's ever done. Well, and it needs to be done, if more so now than ever. So well, that'd be an interesting and a, and a guy to tackle that was if anybody has had a not of so much a career resurgence because he never really went away. It's Clint Eastwood. I mean, goes back from being the probably the biggest next to John Wayne as far as Westerns or even movie stars and action stars up until a certain point. And then, you know, he kind of takes a different path and he's one of the best directors actively directing right now. I mean, his, have you seen Richard Jewell, the movie he did recently? Yes, I have. And it was actually really good. Fantastic. I mean, Didn't market it. yeah, at Grand Torino, another great one. I mean, it's yeah. just hit after hit after hey, hit. Hey dude, he's 90, 90, 91. He's, he's on his way to New Mexico to do his next film. Uh, he's crushing it. So anything I mean, that guy just, touches. He's an amazing human being and he's one of the, he is, he is everything you hope he'd be, you would hope he would be, and then some. He's very cool. And he likes you to screw with him. He doesn't like you to go fawn over him. I call him a big saggy bag of bones, and he calls me shorty. So we're even. <laughs> yeah, he's cool. Um, when, since you've been in this industry, because you've been in this industry for so long, I mean, have you been starstruck by anybody? You said he doesn't like being fawned over and everything like that, but have you ever been starstruck by anybody? 
uh, a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, when I was in college going to ASU, I got a job. My cousin worked for the studios. He was in uh, the Union 399, which is studio transportation. Mm -hmm. So you drove for the studios. And I went and I ended up driving Paul Newman on Butch Cassidy's Sundance Kid. Wow. And it was just me and Paul. And how cool was it? I was starstruck every freaking day. And at the end of the show, we'd go to his house in Coldwater Canyon and he'd make the maid get up because we'd shot all night. And this was on the Western Street at Fox, which is no longer there. And uh, he'd have me come in, he'd get the paper, have a Coors beer, sit and talk to me, maid can make the maid come make me breakfast. And this is our last morning. He slides an envelope across the table to me and he says, just finished kid. And he meant college. Yeah. I go outside. There's three, there's $3,000 cash in the envelope. Jesus. Now I get a call while I'm at ASU at the fraternity house. Hey, you got a call from Art Newman. This is Paul's brother who looked just like him only had this bald as an egg. Yeah. So he said, Hey, Paul wants to know if you're driving this summer. I said, I am. He says, okay, he'd like you to drive him and the lady, his wife, call his wife, the lady on the movie called WUSA, which was awful. It's a piece of shit. So <laughs> I drive him, cut to the chase. Once again, last day, he slides an envelope over. And as I go to grab it, he yanks it back. And he says, you are going to finish, right? And I said, yeah, this is my last year. And he slides it back five grand man, in cash. And that was Paul Newman, man. How, I mean... And then I ran into him later at the Long Beach Grand Prix because, you know, he was, he, they had the Newman Haas racing team and I lived in, in Long Beach. It was very wired into the whole thing there. So I had got some guy, buddies of mine came out of his motor home, the Budweiser motor home, and they said, hey, come with us. And they had a bet that Paul didn't know who I was. So we uh -huh. walk up in the motor home and they go, hey, Paul. They said, uh, hey, hey. And they're going to elbow each other. Hey, you recognize this guy? Paul takes his sunglasses and goes like this. He goes, and they go, see, see, Paul said, wait a fucking minute. Paul goes <laughs> like this, and Paul starts to giggle. And he goes like this. He says, it's Bobby. And these guys fall out. So I step in and go, wait a minute, wait a minute. And they said, what? And I says, I, I looked at Paul. This is a line from the movie MASH. I, I recognize your face, stranger, but your name escapes me. And Paul just starts laughing. He says, yeah, it's Bobby. <laughs> so thank you. For yeah, I, and anyway, I could take too much of your time. Yeah, there's a lot. And, and I think of the people I worked with. I worked with Anthony Quinn and Ann Margaret on a movie called RPM. When I was first out there acting, mm -hmm. I was in the movie Tora, Tora, Tora. It was my first movie, which I every uh, Pearl Harbor day, I wake my wife up and say, we made 17 bucks today. Where you want to go for dinner? <laughs> and but at the same time I was new in Hollywood my agent put me in Tora 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 Robert Altman wanted me to play Radar in the movie MASH and my agent said no one's going to go see that piece of shit everyone's going to go see Tora Tora and the rest is history <laughs> so when I go do my first episode on the TV series Gary Berghoff gets everybody in the operating room where my scene was and tells them this story and Alan Alden and them had medical instruments and all to go schmuck to me, and they start throwing this stuff. Now, my knees are knocking just being on the set. I'm diving to the operating table, right? And I'm looking up at Gary and said, you asshole. You know, but anyway, I've had, a, I've, had, I've had a very blessed life. I've done some in, just incredible things and been with incredible people. Went to ASU. Uh, Sal Banda was my roommate who played for the Open A's. Reggie Jackson was here. I see, I got Reggie on the, to do a, a part on the Jeffersons, and just every, everything in your life crosses. And when I go talk to kids, I tell them you, the biggest assets you're going to have are people. Collect people. You know, all the money in the world and gold network because you're going to go, how'd you get you? Well, my brother's sister's cousin's uncle lived across the street from the guy that owned the restaurant that, you know, who and he gave me a job for the summer to cook. Yeah. You know what I mean? Every, nothing's disconnected. So. Yeah, build bridges, don't burn them down. That's my motto. That's and, right, man. There and go figure out, talk to everyone. That's why I like doing this. This has been the most fun I've ever had over the last couple months is just talking to the people that had such a huge impact on my childhood, my adulthood, and even now my kid's life because I make him watch Turtles every time I watch it. I'm pretty sure he's tired of it. But one day when he's when I'm old and gone or old and gray, he's going to sit back and remember like, damn. Are you going to be able to see a screening? Um, well, not really, because uh, they have them here. However, I work nights, 
Um, yeah. And, you know, I'm just not going to be able to make it. Can't I was hoping. There. Now, I was hoping before COVID because they were, you know, they were pushing it when the 30th. We were, do, we were going to do it Labor Day. Yep. So I had already went out and was waiting for that email to come through because I was waiting just like a kid. They sent open. it to us on the studio, Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. on, it's, a, it's the first digitized version of it is what's going to be cool. That's so fantastic. I'll see it tonight. I haven't looked at that yet. I'll see it tonight. When was the last time you saw this movie? Oh, God. It hasn't been that long. Uh, maybe a couple of months ago, I played it. And, and every time I play it, I'm knocked out. I go, you know, this movie still works. <laughs> it holds. My, someone asked me what my least favorite scene was. And I said, my least favorite scene. The end credits. Was, huh? The end credits. It has to be because there's no more to watch, you know? Oh, my. That's great. My least favorite scene when I was at the rough cut with, with Tom Gray, our boss, and uh, at Goldwyn, a little teeny theater, right? And when they got to the part and were splinters giving the, the exposition on how the turtles came about mm -hmm. and they show those cheesy ass little puppets. They look like you could almost see the strings going pizza, pizza. <laughs> and I looked at Tom and I said, you're shitting me, right? He said, no, 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 no. We'll fix that. And I said, I hope, man. And here's the other part of that story. We get rid get all settled in, goes to dark, movie starts to come up and this mook walks in and sits in front of me and blocks the entire screen and he's got his son with him and I said to Tom look at this asshole he said it's John Candy oh shit <laughs> I said oh that's okay I'll just move over here you know it's Mr. It Candy. John Candy here take my seat don't mind this popcorn you want a soda I'll go get you one Jesus Christ John Candy man Such yeah really he brought his son and he said you know he just loved the movie if anybody I if I could go back in time and bring back anybody. I, I would love to bring back Robin Williams, hands down my favorite com uh, comedian, favorite actor of all time. Um, however, if there's one guy that was taken far too soon, it was John Candy. Planes, trains, yeah. and automobiles, and Uncle Buck are always in rotation. And yeah, in exactly. a couple of weeks, we're yeah. gonna do a watch along with planes, trains, and automobiles with him and Steve Martin, one of the greatest movies of all time. Um, we're gonna I gotta tell you what though, man, this is a message out there to, to all of our, our, our the guys and gals out there. We are the fattest country in the world, and there, and, and I love John too. I got to know him a little bit, but I'm going to tell you, just talking the other day, fat people don't live long. It is so unhealthy. I have a grandson that's 24 that probably weigh is as big as John Candy, yeah. and it's just sad. You can't say anything to the parents, and his wife. We're going to be great grandparents for Christ's sake. Someone said, "How old is your grandson?" I said, "He's eight. They start early now, but he's." <laughs> There's just so many fat people today, man, and it's not healthy. It's bad. Yeah. Fast food. It's got to be something, but it's not. Uh, it's not healthy. No. And you're not. a cook. You know. Yeah. Well, it's, that's, that's the hard part, man. Because when when you start talking food, or when I start talking food, I try to make everything as great as I possibly can. You know. So I'm adding fat. I'm adding salt. But you, it's really when it comes down to it, it's moderation. You know. Don't eat after. Right. Seven o'clock. Don't eat anything super fatty. And if you do, very, very sparingly. And here's the thing, what most people just, most people drink their calories by eating their calories. Um, mm -hmm. Alcohol, sodas, juices, all that shit. You know, I try to limit that as much as possible. My wife's dropped a whole bunch of weight. Um, you know, she went low, low to no carb and then gluten-free because her, she's just having stomach issues. And in and, and the last, what month are we in? We're in November now, sorry. It's feel, this feels like two fucking years at this point. Um, she's lost in an excess of 60 pounds, just cutting out pasta, rice, and sugar. It's yeah, white. You, got, you cut the white stuff out. Yeah. That's what I, I listen. I got person. that. I have that in my home. I, I, I know, man, it's, it's, it, it's, it's bad. And it's, it's worse because it's, you know, it's, we're all in this world together. It's, it's the big joke now that people have not been out of their house for six months and they've gained, you know, 120 pounds, you know, Thanks. so. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a, crazy. It's, hey, I'm going to leave you with this because I, I know you got to go to to your other gig. One of my favorite stories is that you were asking about people that I was in awe of and very much in awe of Mel Brooks. Fantastic. And uh, I was at Fox Studios working on a project with Cheech Marin mm -hmm. and uh, that my friends, the, the Zuckers and Jim Abrams and Pat Prop, that's your airplane naked gun yeah. hot shots guys. We all started together. We're all at the comedy store together. We. I was one of the first comedians at the comedy store pledge class for when it first opened in 72. Now, Mike Biner's just done a thing on Showtime about the history of 
the comedy yeah. store. And frankly, it's, it's those of us that were really there, it's bullshit because he left out the first guys that kept the door. We would do yeah. three shows a night. Yeah. He didn't even have open mic night. They were just begging for somebody to come in and try to get up there and do some comedy. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I had met Mel before. I put a comedy sketch group together that eventually Lorraine Newman is the only one from our group that went and set, did Saturday Night Live. But we were offered the pilot and we turned it down yeah. of SNL back in the day because we thought we were real important. We Our show was a hit and we were getting all these little parts on TV and we said, we're here, you know, little did we know. Yeah. So anyway, so I got to know Mel Brooks and uh, every, whenever we see each other, we exchange an idea of what I got something for you. And the last time I saw him, it was he was getting his star on, on Hollywood. And it wasn't that long ago. I, I'm going, that's your first star after all these years. So I walk in the room and he's in a bunch of people and he always introduces, hey, everybody. I want you to meet, this is Hybe, the Ninja Tidal Poison right here, <laughs> okay? And he loved it. And so I was going back, I was at Fox working with Cheech on a project. I go in the commissary, the cafeteria to eat and I've got this Ninja Turtle jacket on. I don't know if you've seen these. Oh yeah. They, they gave us these jackets when we did the movie. And yeah. I've got this jacket on. And Rudy DeLuca who wrote, right, still writing with him was a friend. He and Sammy Shore started the comedy store actually. And I get some food and I go sit down and Rudy comes over. Now, Ninja Turtles is in the theater now. And, and Rudy comes over and says, hey, Uncle Melvin would like you. Uncle Melvin wants to meet you. Mm -hmm. He wants to know about this turtle thing. He's fascinated by it all. So I get your food, take my tray. I, I, my knees are knocking. My heart is like this. Yeah. And you're trying to be really cool. Yes. Nice to meet you, Mel. You know, but meanwhile, you're, you're shitting your pants. I'm sorry. Had this long conversation about the turtles, how it evolved, and indeed he has a son named Max, and Max was a little kid then. He said, "No, come to the office. What are you doing?" I said, "Well, I'm working with Cheese. How the hell with Cheese? He can wait. Come with me." And I go to his. I spend an hour and a half in his office, mm -hmm. but I'm sitting there. You know, there's that second person in you side of your brain talking to Mel Brooks. <laughs> I'm making Mel Brooks laugh. This is like I, I've I've been killed in a plane crash. I know I have. This is not really happening. Then we get around to, I said, I, you know, about his movies. And I said, I loved History of the World. And I said, I love, it's good to be the king. Because he said it three different ways each time he said it. He'd go, it's good to be the king. Mm -hmm. Then he goes, it's good to be a king. Then he goes, hey, it's good to be the king. <laughs> and he says, I said, I always want to name my production company. It's good to be the king gets on the intercom, Charlie, get in here. He comes in, he had a, he had a pit bull for a, a, a secretary, an old broad. So she comes in, he says, all right, take this note. To Bobby Herbeck, I give, it's good to be the king. <laughs> in return for a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle poster. I have this piece of paper yeah. and it was on his stationery. And we made a trade, but I ended up making, I said, the other end of the trade is I get a producer's poster signed by you, the producers, and you get the turtle poster. So. All these years, we would I'd be invited to screenings and stuff. Still in awe of this man. And, and to finish, the last time I saw him at Musso and Frank's famous eatery in Hollywood, I come in the room. Everybody, it's uh, how you be the teenage uh, uh, mutant ninja turtle poison. Da 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 da. And we get done with our conversation. He always would take my wrist, and he says, "I got something for you." I said, what? He said, it's time now for Teenage Mutant Ninja Grandfather titles, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, what do you got for me? I says, I think you should do History of the World on Broadway. He goes, better than Blazing Saddles? I said, you got the music. He says, you know, you might be on some because he was looking for the next thing yeah. to put on, you know, to adapt to Broadway. Mm -hmm. And then, as you know, this, so this is maybe four or five years ago. As you know, SNL did a, a middle-aged Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle sketch here not too long ago. Yeah, I said, they're stealing our bacon, you know? <laughs> so it would be fun to do something like that, though. There, you, uh, you, you brought up, you brought up, and we've we still got a little time if you do. Um, I don't have to get ready for about another 45 minutes. I won't keep you on here for another 45 minutes, but I got a little bit of time. Okay. Um, but you brought up one thing that I'm absolutely enamored by, and that's the comedy store. Um, did you have any dealings with Mitzi? Uh, she's since passed, obviously, but I mean, did you have any dealings? Hello, with yes. <laughs> Hello, Bobby, Bobby. Yes, I had a lot to do with it. First of all, Sammy Shore and Rudy DeLuca started the comedy store. Yeah. 
And Rudy DeLuca, when Mitzi died, said, isn't this a bit? It's it, all these articles, you know, that Sam, that Mitzi's, you know, the mother of the comedy store and this. He yeah. said, they forget, we started the comedy store. She got it in the divorce uh, when she divorced Sammy. Yeah. And she was loved by, you know, she was loved, she was loved by a lot of the guys. So that, yeah. that I could go deep on that, but I don't want to go there. No, that, that's perfectly fine. If you'd have heard Polly at her at her life celebration, I mean, it was there's, just uh, there's he no killed, way. he killed the room. Polly did because he came out with I, I won't say uh, you know who Argus Hamilton is. I do not know. He's been the life. I used to be the MC at one time. Later in life, Argus became the house MC. Mm -hmm. Polly gets out in front of everybody. He's all these faces and everybody who ever worked there and beyond. And everybody figures this, you know, they're emotional. They figure well, poor Polly's gonna collapse or just start crying. Polly gets up and he goes, Argus Hamilton fucked my mommy. That's how he opened it. Everybody absolutely fell out. You know, this is how Polly would open his, you know, his uh, words for his mother who had his passed on. Mitzi was the ultimate J Jewish American princess. She was a good gal. She had a great sense of humor. She was a cheerleader, but she was she's a businesswoman, and yeah. she really got the thing out around the world. And uh, Bud Freeman always being the the competition, the improv. And then they, in California, there's the Ice House, which is my favorite room to play. Yeah, it's, it's just the best room in, there. The Troubadour is the, another great room. Uh, anyway, so. Mitzi, we were the comedy store players. Mm -hmm. It was a sketch group. And it really was Pat Prop and Bo Capral, Carol White, and um, oh God, Steve, rest his soul. He was our mentor. He's uh, uh, Gary Austin. Gary Austin was with the committee originally. He's the one. We were the only show in town, by the way, who was doing sketches. Yeah. Okay. Other than the committee was on Sunset Boulevard in the really cool days of Sunset Boulevard in the 70s. From, Whereupon that great uh, documentary is out, Echo in the Canyon, mm -hmm. about the musicians. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's great. Okay. And so anyway, so Mitzi comes downstairs one day and we're rehearsing in her basement. That's mops and paint cans and smell like a toilet. And, yeah. and she says, hey, you're rehearsing in my, you can't rehearse down here. I'm going to have to charge you for using my basement. And we went, you are you serious we're working for free here in case you haven't noticed and you want to charge us to use this basement so we told her to piss off and we went and found a theater and put a, a built a show and we were the only show like that in town this is when lauren lauren michaels came and saw the show but we the only one in game in town doing a, show, a sketch show like that mm -hmm. Not what Second City was doing, you know, in, in Chicago and in, I guess, Canada, too, as well. But yeah, they had we were it back in the 70s. So Mitzi ran us off. And then our names were on the side, painted on the side of the store. And next thing we know, our names are no longer painted on the side of the comedy store. So and I saw Seinfeld went in, 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 went in there with um, oh, Gary, the really good comedian that died last year. The one who had the talk show that was so brilliant. Uh, anyway. You know I'm Shanling. So he and Shanling are doing a, one of his comedians in cars getting coffee yeah. show. And so they went to the comedy store. And Seinfeld said, Mitzi didn't like me. You don't see one picture of me up here. My name's not on the wall. She didn't care for me. So she had her pets. I was a pet for a while. Yeah. So, but you know what? They were great days back then, man. They were really, it was a whole different animal. And to see the pe where people ended up, I mean, Rudy DeLuca, Barry Levinson, Craig T. Nelson were a brilliant comedy team. And they went on, they were on Sonny and Cher, I think, and a few summer shows uh, doing th their thing. And then Craig just went completely nuts. So they packed him up and sent him back to Washington. And, and Rudy and Barry went writing for, ended up writing Carol Burnett. Yeah. And which I would come in, they'd have people like me come in and work a sketch with them, do improv. Yeah. Now, Gary Austin was, if you ever heard the Groundlings, Gary Austin started the Groundlings. And the Groundlings came out of the comedy store players. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, I know I could go on forever, but it's got just a great, 
base to it that how it what happened to people you look back all these years later and see that barry became one of the great directors of all time craig a great actor rudy's written everything with mel since uh, god i think the what was the first movie they did with him might have been young frankenstein i could be wrong there but we would go because mel would come see our comedy group have us come down and hang, hang around the stage he says i'm going to find a spot for you in this movie mm -hmm. And we sit there and then just watch him direct these movies, you know. So anyway, long history. I'm going to do a book. I got to do a book. Everyone says it's I got my books called The Nobody Show Business Knows is my book. So I'm going have to. Have you thought about putting that up on Kickstarter? What's that? Uh, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people that are writing a book or, you know, they want to they want to start writing one. And one thing most people can't find or most people don't want to do is self-publish because it's a huge cost up front, or they're, they're having trouble getting with some of the publishers. So what a lot of people do is they'll, they'll say, Hey, I'm going to write this book like yourself and other voice actors and shit like that. And then they'll like, you know what, if we can hit $20,000 or whatever, right? So it's essentially, Hey, I'm writing this, you hit these different level tiers, and then the crowd and the fans of you help fund this book so it can really you know, not be Is it so like fund me like fund me it's like that but you can go um it, it like would go fund me people can just give you money if they want to with uh kickstarter what they do is so say say you want twenty thousand dollars to write a book right and then you mm -hmm. put in tiers in there and what a lot of people do is if you pay ten dollars you know you'll get a little thank you to all the people in the back of the book right or if you hit a hundred dollars it'll be like oh man i'm going to send you a letter just different things that you can come up with to really drum up business drum up people wanting to support it and then thanking the fans by like saying hey you know some of them if you down at a thousand dollars i'll give you a call or some shit like that and we'll talk for five minutes so it's sure. a little way to engage and then talk with your audience and then just to help fund it through 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 a campaign that you don't have to self-publish, you know. So yeah, interesting. Well, you know, yeah. I haven't dug real deep. What I'm doing is what I'm trying to do is when I get up in the morning, is I'll get this little book here mm -hmm. and I just start jotting down things that have happened to me. Yeah. In my life. And I'm one of those people that my wife will tell you, we can be in uh, we can be in uh, who gives a shit Idaho and run into somebody that either I know or we that we both, you know, small world is what I'm saying. I should call the book small world because it is unbelievable. But first I'm an Air Force brat, so I moved every two years. So I be I I my I have the muscle developed to meet people and not be shy and be a bit of an extrovert and type A and all the things needed. And uh, it's just, it's just incredible. I'll start telling stories and go, God, people always go, wow, Herbs, you got to write a book, man. I mean, <laughs> even if it's one page about something that happened, you know, you got to put that down because I have really, and it continues. It, I mean, to this, to, to this earlier this week, I went to an election night thing and met some some pretty high powered people, you know, and I'm going like, wow, who knew somebody that I knew and so on. And it's just, that's what it does. Well, you could also do a blog. If, if, if a book is just something like uh, I do a cooking show every, well, I used to do it three times a week, but just with my kids karate, um, the podcast that I'm doing now work and everything else. I mean, my kids going to karate six days a week at this point, anywhere from two to three hours of pop. And then we've got tournaments on the weekends um, almost every other Saturday. So it's just, I need more hours in the day. Um, yeah. so when I was trying to look at stuff that I can cut back, I'd never wanted to cut back the podcast, but it's because I'm having so much fun with it. It's the funnest thing I've ever done. Cool. I've done a lot of stuff. I've been all over this world. You say you're a, a Air Force brat. I was actually in the Navy for about seven and a half years. Um, and just seeing all of this stuff. And you said you're in bumfuck Idaho, right? You know, I'm across the country, or across the world, right? I see somebody that knew me but they knew me through my brother. I met him in Dubai. They knew my brother in high school. I haven't right. seen this guy in 10 years. I used to have hair down past my shoulders before I joined the Navy. Right. And then he kept going, I know you, I know you. So it's, it's, it's crazy to meet somebody. I know, but it's cool. Miles away. You know, it's really fun seeing that type of stuff. Um, I was talking about Reggie Jackson. I was driving across the country many years ago mm -hmm. and I'm literally in the middle of nowhere, Utah. And there's a film crew working and I get out and, saunter out. I think there's, I'm going to know somebody, right? There's Reggie, Reggie Jackson. And we've run into each other in damn this place. He says my name, Dick Inberg, who's one of my dear friends. 
always loved that Reggie said my whole name is one word, Bobby Herbeck. It wasn't <laughs> Bobby Herbeck, Bobby Herbeck. And, and Inberg would introduce me to people, this is Bobby Herbeck. And they go, what was your name again? Or what's your last name? And anyway, I run into Reggie in the middle of nowhere. And he said, Bobby Herbeck, I will run into you on Mars. I run into you in the damnedest places. And I'm serious, I'd be in Seattle at this big surprise 50th birthday party for Bruce McCall, McCall Cellular, there's Reggie. Race Bobby Irvin, here you are again. I mean, it was just weird. And then the only, the first Yankee game I went to in 1977, the Dodgers and the Yankees World Series, Reggie got me two seats yeah. for my nephew who was living there. It's the night he hit the three home runs mm -hmm. and they won the series. He calls me the next morning, Bobby Irvin, you come to your first Yankee game and I hit three dingers. Where have you been? I said, I've been in California. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's just my life, man. And it's cool. I mean, it's fantastic. I mean, if, if a book wasn't your route, if you didn't want to do it long format, um, the reason I brought up the whole, because uh, it's called the Vanilla Gorilla Kitchen. I go in there, I show people everything that I've learned throughout the years in cooking. Uh, my friend talked me into doing it. He just wanted me to do a blog at first. You just go up there and you just type like what you do with your little book. You, know, you go and write down a crazy story that happened or something that happened, right? And then you start collecting all these things. And then people go and they read your blog. They're like, oh man, this dude is hilarious. He's telling me Mel Brooks stories. I'm hearing Paul Newman, Art Newman, all this crazy stuff. The comedy store, Mitzi, Sandy, all these people, Polly Shore talking. I know. Dude, banging his mom. Polly Shore, <laughs> one, of the, one of the best stand-ups I've ever seen was I was in the uh, Funny Bone, I think it was the Funny Bone, in Norfolk, Virginia, when I was still stationed up there a few years back. <clears throat> Polly Shore comes in, and I'm a huge Polly Shore fan, from son-in-law to in the army now, to insert whatever Polly, I was such a Polly fanatic growing up. Um, I tried, I, I, I wanted, when I had long hair, I wanted hair like Polly, he had that real long curly hair. Yeah. And then I found out that you could get that if you go and get a perm. I didn't know what a perm was. My mom would get one back in the 90s and stuff. So I saw her and I was like, ah, I'm not getting a perm. I'm not going to have my hair twisted up and heated. Um, but but yeah, it, it's just, it's funny. And I think a blog would be really fun for you too, because it'd be another way for you to connect with the fans and you really wouldn't have to wait, you know, for a year or two years, however long it would take you to publish a book. Um, yeah, you know, well, that, that it's worth thinking. I, I'll give some thought to it. I was trying to find a picture of my permed hair. <laughs> oh, you had a perm? <laughs> oh, who didn't back then? <laughs> I mean, when I got married, I'm trying to find a wedding picture. Yeah, I just saw it yesterday. I got, yeah, I got the perm going. Not the full, yeah. but you know, I wasn't out here. Just tight, you know, because I've got John Denver hair. So this was, you know, this, the perm was a thing for a while. So <laughs> this is the perm stayed part of your life, right? Let's go. I tell you what, I was in the Navy Avrock program, my brother. So we have a connection there. Thank I was going know. to ASU and they were pulling guys out that, Send the nom, man. I ran. My dad was an Air Force pilot. Said, if you go in as a grunt, I'll, I'll kick your ass. And I, the Navy came on campus and with this app, ABA, reserve aviation program. And I got in and I got like three or four of my fraternity brothers in. They ended up being lifers. Yeah. We ran. The one guy's wife came up to me when we had a reunion here several years ago. Said, I've always wanted to meet you, Bobby Herbeck. She said, I have a bone to pick with you. I said, rut row. What do I do? She says, you're the reason I have eight kids. It's every <laughs> time that John came back from the ship, he knocked me up and went back out on the ship. I have eight children because of you, because you talked him into this afterlife. I said, I had nothing to do with this place. <laughs> Self-defense. I, I tried that. <clears throat> so obviously you see all the toys, but if there's anything I collect more, on a little bookshelf over here, it's just nothing but comic books. It's, some turtle stuff, but it's all over the thing. So when I started getting into comics again, when I was younger, <clears throat> not when I was younger, but when I started, you know, having a paycheck from the Navy, um, I started watching videos on what to pull, what, 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 what books were good, what was everybody reading, because I'd been out of the game for so long. And there was this uh, YouTube, his name, um, Spider Mike or something like that. And he actually went to my comic book store of all places, Small World, right? That's the, right. Name, that's the name of your book. It has to be Small World at this point. Right. So I see him and my wife is with me and my, I would sit there and I'd put down 60, 70 bucks a week almost in comics and my wife would just sit there and shake her head. And then I was like, look, this is Spider Mike. And she was like, and I was like, this is the guy you can play for all of these comic books. This guy, he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. He's like, I just said what was good, what you should read. I didn't tell you to go out there and buy it. I was like, no, 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 you can't backstep. You can't backpedal here. It's your fault, not mine. Please talk to my wife. <laughs> 
So right, right, right. It didn't work. It didn't work too well. I tried to, you know, push off but the blame. You know what, though, dude? She's supportive. She's very supportive. I mean, she I mean, is. Hey, hey, they're not going to not. They're not going to take a little bite when they can. But trust me, you know, I, I my deal, I, I just, we just celebrated 30 years, Tammy and I. It was her birthday yesterday, too. Oh, but I, 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 but the best part of my life when you'll get there are my grandkids who also moved to Arizona. That's why we came to Arizona because they left California too. We were all together for Granny's birthday last night. I, they, I'm taking, I'm taking to the screening Saturday. That's fantastic. You got to remember they weren't born when this thing happened. I mean, I and hope you know, they they've got poster. My oh, the oldest has got a poster. The oldest in this side of the family, mm -hmm. and I, they're all at dinner last night. Oh, we got to go Saturday. We're gonna go. We're gonna go. Pops can pop was gonna get up and talk a little bit. Neither, but I love them so much, man. I tell all my friends you're gonna become grandparents. They say best part of your life's just about to start, dude. So just <laughs> be ready. That's fantastic. You know? But if your wife supports that, you know, I mean, they have to because it's like me. Tammy has to put up with this. <laughs> you know, because I'll go do some stand up somewhere. She'll go. I'll go to a, a, a fundraiser and I'll get up and either MC it or do a little sh uh, stand up, you know. And but I take uh, a, a few years ago, I took a they, the Long Beach um, Breast Cancer was, uh, Foundation was having a, a, a fundraiser and they asked me to bring a poster and sign it. And I said, sure. And I bring it. Tammy sees it in the car. She said, what are you going to do with that? And I said, they want to auction it off. She said, no one's going to buy that. <laughs> End of the night, we're driving home. She said, how much did they get for that poster? I said, they got $850. Hey. Tammy goes, wait, Tammy goes, what? Husband, you've got to get a truckload of those. I said, oh, <laughs> now you're changing your story. So we started doing the math. So I said, say I get online and I sold 2 million of them. And then I said, 500. I'll cut it down to 500. Sign. Yeah. I said, that's a hell of a lot of money. And if somebody sued me, I have enough money here. Take your 150 million. I got my 350. <laughs> you know, it, it's a, it's a hundred percent right. I mean, I, I've never had. I always say it, you never promote yourself the way nobody will ever promote you more than you promote yourself. Nobody's going to be your biggest fan other than yourself. And I've always said that. And then we've been married. Uh, coming up this May is uh, 12 years. So we've been married for quite not not as long as the 30 years, but we've been married for quite some time. Um, you know, and, and time enough for the rings to see, so to speak. <laughs> what's, what's that? Time enough for the rings to see, as they do in a car in the Pistons. You know, they say, gotta get some miles on this car before it's really gonna work right. Yeah, they, well, she likes she likes to say, I'd never divorce you, you know, because I'd have to train somebody else to you know, do the other stuff. So I'm like, yeah, yeah. amen. There's a girl. In fact, I tell people if if I, um, if, if the doctor told me you got a month to live, the first guy I'm going out to take out of the system is the one that said, happy wife, happy life. I'm going to shoot him right between the eyes because it's bullshit. <laughs> right? Because she can be so happy. Oh, husband, oh, I just love it. Five minutes later, rah, 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 rah. I go back, back. <laughs> So, uh, well, since we're, we're winding down here, so I want to ask you a few questions. I had a whole bunch of them written down, but I, I don't like following a format. I like talking and making it organic because it feels more fun than me just going, what was your favorite scene? Who yeah, no, it's cool. Though. It's like you and I are just hanging in a bar somewhere. That's, that's exactly why, why I like to keep it this way, man, because it's fun. Everybody sees the excitement from both parties and it just feels honest and it feels real. Right? Organic. It's yeah. organic. Organic at 100%. Grass fed. <laughs> grass fed right you know homegrown if you will homegrown yeah um no. so you know you've said uh i can't remember who who it was but and i can't remember what interview it was it was from last year or the it was the san diego one you did a few months back with uh with kim and you said when the movie came out you were promised you pointed at a, at a car it was a mercedes who was that person that said they would buy you that, that evil man the evil man was Tom Gray, who was our my boss, our boss at Golden Harvest, who it took me forever to, to, to bite on uh, making this movie because he kept calling it the Ninja and Pinjin Turtles and just finish the movie on pain, you don't bother with the turtle thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the week the movie was opening, we're in Beverly Hills, we're going to lunch and we're on Santa Monica Boulevard, or Wilshire Boulevard, Santa Monica. And, uh, Tom says, boy, Herbs, I hope we don't have, have Howard the Duck. I said, I have Howard the Duck. You got a built-in audience. You're going to do $20 million. I'm calling it $20 million. He said, Herbs, if we do $20 million or anything above that, 
Golden Harvest would buy you anything that you want. And so, you know, I could have said yacht. I could have said a place in Tuscany, but I was being fair. Yeah, being and concerned. right then, this two-seater Mercedes pulled up, black with a butterscotch interior, top down. And I looked over and I says, I want one of those. He said, Mercedes, SL, SL, whatever the hell it was. And I said, yeah, you got it, Herbs. Movie opens at 23, 25, somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Never, ever got the car. Never got a dinner. Never got the car. Well, now that I know it was Thomas Gray, because I actually, I ha I've been talking with him. Uh, he just had to have a surgery, so he's had to back out a few times. Um, I don't know if you're, if you still are in contact with Tom. Um, well, I haven't been, but if you, if you talk to him, you tell him I, Herb sends his best. He's an Arizona boy, too. He yeah. went to the U of A, I went to ASU, so we're rivalries. <laughs> I call him Tom Cat. But uh, I reached out to him, uh, and he's going to come on here when he's feeling a little bit better. But it's nice to know, uh, it's, shit, did I mute? Oh, no. Uh, it's nice to know, um, you know, when I get him on, that's the first question I'm going to ask him. I'm like, where's Bobby's car at? You, you promised him that convertible. We need to get it for him. Um, yeah. So, and then the last question that I really wanted to ask you, I think you said, you know, your favorite, one of your favorite scenes was the Kodak moment. Um, one of them was, and then. Uh, shit. The other one was, the other one was when they bring her, bring April down to the basement, yeah. she's unconscious <laughs> and they go, can we keep her? Like, you know. Yeah, what what are the connotations there? <laughs> and yeah. what are you going to do? <laughs> when, when you think of those two scenes, and you brought up the pizza pizza one that you said you absolutely hated, but when you've seen it in movies, it works, right? No, it was times gone by, I accept it, but it was just it's just so cheesy to me. It, it was it was back pizza! <laughs> come on, can you come up with something that's not on strings? <laughs> <laughs> now since since you've gotten, you know, I'm not going to say older. You've uh, progressed like fine. You can say older. I am older. You know, you've evolved. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be with you, man. Oh, God, I'm okay. I'm better. Oh, yeah. Grown, yeah, go ahead. Man. You've grown. You've experienced some shit. You've seen some stuff, right? All right. Those original two scenes or those three scenes, if you want to keep catch the pizza pizza one in there. What other ones that, since you've gotten older, you're looking at it from a different perspective, or you're looking at it from different glasses, what ones stick out now as, as being some of your favorite? Well, I, I, loved, uh, oh, I loved the brilliance of Steve Barron mm. at the opening. I'm at the th I went to bounce around at different theaters the day it opened, and I'm watching kids at the edge of their seat leaning towards the screen because they're dying to see what the turtles are going to look like. Yes. And he teased him with the manhole cover and Raffi looking up and the light strobing off of him and drops it and goes, damn. And then the kids are like, yeah. And they scoot more because now we go to the sewer and you see him in silhouette. And then they come into view. The theater just exploded. I get goosebumps every, I just told a story that every freaking time I tell us I get goosebumps. Well, that just means it just, it I sit there and go, I, I like I told somebody, first time you see yourself on a screen as an actor, well, anytime, not TV. But a movie screen, you go, holy shit. And you know, I saw myself at the premier tour tour. I slid on the floor, was on the first row of the balcony. So there was a wall. I didn't couldn't even look. And my wife at the time, I that I my college sweetheart is going, get up, get up. No, 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 let me know when it's over. It won't be long, but let me know. It's just frightening. And then the sea, but but I, I got kind of got uh a little bit used to it because when I write something and then it'd be on TV in a few weeks and you go, how cool is that? It came from here to there to there. And then when this picture happened, because it takes a little time, more time, more involved, uh, the Hensons, the, the meetings, the getting together. I went to Northampton, spent some several weeks with Peter and Kevin. They had to sign off on the story for the move. Just all the steps leading up to going that screening day that John Candy was there trying to see the movie, but for John Candy, you big mook, and going, how, just sitting in there and getting goosebumps. That's when I told Tom Gregg, and when, later when he asked me what I thought, the movie, I knew when I saw that screening movie was going to be a hit. Yeah. I had no doubt in my mind, your instinct, my, my, my instincts are right, and to see that up on the screen and then listen to the response in the crowd, there's no high better than that. Yeah. There's no high as a comedian than to get laughs. Yeah. So there's no how you're getting laughs. You're getting people are getting what you're saying. They're getting the message. Visually, it was there. I mean, Steve Barron was, was brilliant. The Hensons, it was all a team effort. Yeah. The, the turtle guys. 
I mean, what they went through to make that movie, and then you had the stunt guys who were in costumes that weighed about 200 pounds less than the ones the, the actors were in. Yeah. Uh, just a team effort on every, on, oh, and, and I love Elias. He's just a really cool guy. I, I like, I just liked it very much. I, I was very pleased and uh, we're blessed, man. I told you at the beginning of the end, we're, you ask me what I think, I walk in and look at this stuff. I just uh, almost genuflect to it. Got my boy here. Leonardo, even though Raffi is me, by the way, people ask him, which, which turtle are you, Raffi? Yeah, that's my, like I said, he was my first turtle I ever put on my arm. Oh, was he? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, and he's, like I said, it, it's just, it's sickening how much of this shit I just have all over the damn place. I mean, Raff's my guy. <laughs> Raff, that's Raff, so cool, though. God Raff, bless you. Yes, thanks. Yeah, hey, I mean, you're a really great, man. Stay in touch with me. Uh, oh, hands down, I will. Yeah, we'll hook up again. We'll get, we'll get together again. Uh, I'm sorry it took so long to get this done. It's been, uh, it's been a few crazy weeks. It was leading up to this and other things going on here on the home front. But my wife's been battling with some things. So we're, but we finally got her in going down the right road. You know, when you move and you move, you're in the military, and we were in California all these years, yeah. and then we move here where she never wanted to come. She's a Orange County girl, but yeah. loves it. Mm -hmm. But you move, you got to find new doctors. Yeah. And that's really hard. And then you got to find the other important part of the team is a good plumber and a good electrician. You got to find those. And, and an air conditioner guy here in Arizona, because it's the hottest year ever in Arizona. It was 100 in April. Yeah. And it's in the 90s. So when you, hell, you're in Florida. I, I, you know, I, you're, you're looking at me like, oh, like, I feel bad for you, dude. No. I, I trust me, I 100% get like I grew up in Florida. I don't want to be in Florida anymore. I want to go back. I lived in Washington and outside in Seattle, the prettiest place I've ever been in. Awesome. Yeah, awesome. Washington. You um, know what? I just hope and pray for you, my brother, our kids, our grandkids, whatever's going on with this, this government. And I mean, on both sides of the aisle, they got to get their shit together. Yeah. You, you cannot take this country and you were, you served the country and, and God bless you for that. Hats off to you. You know, just I'm I'm worried about my grandkids. I and I'm not talking about who wins this because either way, it's just crazy. Yeah, they should take a bulldozer and bulldoze everybody in the Capitol Dome and shove them in the Potomac and start from scratch because so much corruption, dude. It's terrible. This will be my next Ninja Turtle movie: corruption <laughs> instead of corruption and eruption. Instead of fight, huh? instead of fighting Shredder, they're fighting. They're fighting anybody and everybody that's just lying in their pockets. But you know, it's it's gone through. So I, I'll leave you with this. I want to ask your opinion on some. So, what do you think of Michael Bay's uh, what he did to the turtles? Honestly, the movies yes. weren't bad. Um, I did not like what I like about these guys. They, as dumb as this is going to sound, they look and felt real. Right. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was that kid that was looking in the sewers, looking down. Oh, yeah. I wanted to see if they were <laughs> real. Right? I believed that these were real. Now, you flash forward 2014, I think is when that first one came out. And then 2016, Out of the Shadows came out. So we're going back six years. I'm 25 at that time. All right. So I'm older than I was as a kid. And I, but, but for some reason, sitting there in there, in the in the uh, in the screening, I didn't feel the same way I felt. I didn't love that that turtle, but as being older and have more per, more of a life perspective on it, I just looked at it as like, this isn't me, right? That poster sitting behind you, that poster sitting behind me, that is for me. That is my turtles. That'll never go okay. away. Right. I still watch that movie at least once a week, whether I'm sitting down watching it or I have it in the background. When I'm mm -hmm. sitting here writing or I'm sitting here thinking of ideas or thinking of shit in some way, shape or form, I've got it on in the background at least once a week. Mm -hmm. um, that that's for me. I just learned that, you know, there's going to be shit for me. There's not going to be shit for me um, as a whole. I loved it because my kid liked the movie um, and it was a way I was just coming off of a, a, a deployment, a hard deployment. Um, you know, and he was at that middle stage of like, why are you going away for so long? Why can't you just stay here with me? I like it. Well, when we well, play. I'm glad you're here, buddy. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad I am too. I'm glad I made the choice to get out in 2016. Um, yeah. because I, I just missed so much with him. His first four years, I was gone almost, almost all the time. That um, sucks. It, it does. I know this. I grew up this way. Yeah. You My know, dad being an Air Force pilot, you know, 
And we yeah. lived in Okinawa, but you know, he was gone for a year before he could get us over there. Yeah. When I was young, when and you know, when I was at that age, you need to be with your dad. Yeah. You know, and when so you get to be I, a teenager, it's not that it's important, but you got other friends or sports, and da, 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 you want your dad there. But when you're like in that 10 to 12 area and stuff, and you're younger, you know, yeah. four and seven, it's important to have pops around, man. Yeah, so, it's just, I, it's, I hear you. Especially, you know, with me, I didn't have that father fit. He went to prison when I was young. He's, we've since reconnected. We didn't talk for almost a decade because it just didn't seem like he wanted me. You know what I'm saying? And I'm not going to get all sappy and all that shit on here because at this, at this day and age. I came from the same thing, man. I always, I saw my real dad twice in my life. Yeah. Herbeck was my, adopted me when I was four and he's, he will forever be my dad and my hero and I will forever be his son. So. And that, 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 that's what you can always just strive to be, especially as a father. You know, so I, when I started asking getting asked that question, I was like, I just can't do this anymore. So I got out and then, like I said, he's doing karate now and he loves it. And it's because of the Ninja Turtles. It, I don't cool. get what anybody says. We watched that cartoon that happened in 2012. And the whole reason he is doing karate is because he wanted to be a ninja like his favorite turtle. He mm -hmm. wanted to be Leonardo whether it was with swords or, you know, he does weapons class now and he's got the bow staff because they don't, they don't go straight to katanas, you know, when they're nine and 10 years old, they don't want, they want everybody to come back with five, uh, 10 fingers and 10 toes. Right, 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 right. right. So, you know, his, his introduction into what he loves now the most karate is because of Ninja Turtles and yeah. I don't get there and he doesn't get there if I don't get what you guys gave us right. and you can be as blessed as you say you are, but it, but at the end of the day, I can't think people like you, Steve Barron, Ken Scott, Robbie Rist, Cameron, uh, I'm sorry, Kim, for most people just known by Kim, Gary Proper, you know, all these people had, you guys just came together and you made the equivalent of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's not me diminishing it. A peanut butter and jelly sandwich is the perfect sandwich. Right. You guys made a perfect movie. And from my heart and my kid's heart and everything that I've experienced over these last 25 years with the turtles, it all started with you. And I can't thank you enough for what you have done for me. And well, I thank you, my brother, because you're, you're, you got people like you were doing it. Well, you did it, served our country. So a double bueno for you. <laughs> and you, you're what keeps the, the machine going. I mean, you guys, it's unbelievable. And the fans and you guys pull, you guys are there for the fans. I mean, but the, and don't get me, I don't want to step on yours, but I mean, the guy, Chris from um, the old turtle den, uh, the TMNT Minute guys, everybody so in our back and in our band, you're like you, you know, you, it's a lot of love here. And that's, I'm good with that. It be, cause there's too much hatred out there. I like the love, the love's yeah. better. Yeah. I well, mean, that's a good thing about the turtles. Yeah. It always brings everybody together, man. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, well, I'm hoping we can get a reboot. I'm going to get you to help us our campaign. We want to get everybody on the bandwagon to get and get a shout out to buy a common bang on the doors and go, let them do a reboot. If, if I can do anything and make that happen, I will do everything in my power. However, you guys, Powers in the numbers. you got it. You got to keep, we need Steve Barron back. There's a reason that second and that third one did not hit or register as much right. It's because they didn't have you. It's because they, they didn't have Steve Barron. They didn't have the heart and soul behind those movies. Like they yeah. did in the first one. Right. Well, Steve was, so. Steve was amazing. Brian Henson. Everything, everything about that was it's timing and life is timing. We did, there was a big conversation and Tom Gray will tell you about when they were going to open that picture. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying just in passing, I wasn't in a particular meeting, but I remember saying to Tom, why don't you open it during the uh, spring break? No, no, they don't own movies during. That's when the kids are out of school. Yeah. That's when they open March 30th, spring mm -hmm. break. You want to go up against Christmas in the summer. It's, it's yeah. crazy. It's a, it's a gangbang of pictures. You don't want to do that. We yeah. were up against Pretty Woman. It was them one weekend, it was us, box office. They, and so when we got this award, we got the People's Choice Award. If I could do this real quick. We got this award on national TV, Kim and I and the guys. Mm -hmm. And we were, that was the, the uh, Desert Storm uh, time. And yeah. I got up and said, if the, they send the Ninja Turtles over there, this thing will be over in two days. Is what I remember saying that at the award show, right? <laughs> Everybody's laughing. But uh, who was hosting the show, the, 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 the People's Choice Awards show that night? Mm -hmm. Julia Roberts and Richard Gere, the people we were up against the whole. <laughs> How great was that? 
And we couldn't figure out why they had an edge about themselves the whole night. And it was it was actually years later. It was actually this year, I think, when Kim, we were in the conversation, when Kim said, we're up against Pretty Woman. I said, that explains why they didn't give us the time of day that night. You know, and then my cousin, who's like my brother, just got done telling me, oh, yeah, I was in charge of the transportation for Pretty Woman. I said, what? (laughs) You're telling me this now? Anyway, thank you all. We're hoping for another one. Hey, like I said, anything we can do, anything I can do, man, I'm going to do my power. If I got to sit there and write my congressman every day to get a new Turtles movie and they can sit there, I'm going to make sure it gets done. You do it, buddy. And I get down to Florida, I'll find you. I may be coming down. They're going to do some screenings at the drive-ins down there. Oh, that's fantastic. Any Anytime. I always throw this invite out there to whoever I talk to, as long as they're cool people. And you've been such a cool guy and gracious with your time. Anytime you want to come down here and you're anywhere, anywhere near Orlando, I will treat you to the best meal you will ever have in your life. I will be in Orlando. Have you have you met Kim in per, face-to-face yet? No, I've, I've done the same thing we're doing now, um, but no, I but haven't. You know, I haven't he's, you know he's in Orlando, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, uh, when we were talking the other day, he had to get going to go to the uh, the screening. There was some issues or whatever. Um, and same thing, he's an Orlando guy. Yeah, there were some issues because AMC didn't, was it Fathom? was concerned AMC didn't want us to, to appear at these screenings and we're going, well, that, that makes no sense. Yeah. I mean, if you're going to bring somebody. So bring- Fathom was upset because Kim and I went and called a couple of the theater general managers and they were all like, we're, we would love that, but we got to go through protocol. Yeah. And in the, this last week, all of a sudden they said, yeah, the head office said, fine, bring it on. Well, hopefully, hopefully next year, um, we can roll it out and we can just redo the 30th anniversary. We won't even count this year as the 30th anniversary. We'll count it in 2021. Hopefully we can do that at least and we can get it into more theaters. You got uh, you got uh, the secret of the U's next year too. It, oh shit, I did forget. No, but no, no, but it was, is next year their 30th? Weren't they two years later? I think, I think they were 92. Uh, give me yeah, it's not next year. Um, so yeah, I believe it was 92 secret of the- Kim and I were talking about this the other day in an interview and I said, I don't think the secret of the use is next year. Oh, no, it is. Yeah. 90, is it, really? it came out eight days before March 22nd, 1991. No so, kidding. Three, Man, they got on that. Yeah. Three, uh, 357 days or some shit like that. Yeah, man. That's a, that's record breaking. Yeah. No shit. Wow. Um, but I'm going to go ahead. I'm a, I am hate getting off this because I've had so much fun talking. Okay, we'll do it again. Yeah, no problem. Is there anything? Thank you. Uh, no, no, thank you. Is there anything that you're working on other than getting the uh, the reboot going or anything that you're trying to push fans to other than what we just talked about? I'm working on, I've got a project at Columbia Sony and I'm going to co-write and co-produce. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the working title is Caught Red-Handed. Uh, and I've got a, I'm also, I do voiceover work and I fell into a nice little niche here recently. There's a series coming on HBO called Gamora. It's, oh. a, it's an Italian production. It's basically The Sopranos, mm-hmm. Italian production. It was uh, from my buddy who runs Columbia Pictures said it was a great book. Uh, the movie was good and this series would be great. And I one day got a call about two months ago from my agent said, do you want to do uh, dub a voice for this series? And I said, sure. So I'm dubbing the voice of a guy in there called Don Aneo, which is kind of like the mentor, the old guy. And uh, the director loves me. And I got a steady gate with this show. And I said, the director recently, I said, Armas, I said, how long before you knock my Don off in the show? And he says, oh, no, we're not knocking Don off. No, Don's going to be to the very end. I said, good. I hope hope this show runs for 10 years. He said, me too. <laughs> so I'm doing that for fun because I can keep my acting chops. It's cool. You're essentially Splinter right now, just for in the mafioso world. You know, how does that make you? So? Yeah. <laughs> Think of that. Yeah. yeah but I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what real quick. In the pizza party thing we did, how cool is Kevin Clash? Oh, dude. Hands did down. Did you know he did Elmo? What's crazy is I didn't know he did Elmo until years after this. So with comic book people, especially me, and I want to talk for everybody, there is a voice that I hear whenever a specific character is in a panel in any of my comic books. You know, so if we're just talking turtles, Josh Pice is Raphael. That's the voice I hear. Brian Tochi is Leonardo. Robbie Rist, Corey Feldman is Michelangelo and Donatello. And when I read Splinter, I'm hearing Kevin Clash as Splinter. Yeah. Um, those are the voices. I never put it together. I got to tell you, 
I never put it together. And he showed up for the read through and Kevin clashed and went, Oh my God, he's the one that did splinter. Yep. I never connected that. Fantastic. And he supposedly created Elmo. Yep. Yep. He's got, that. Just, he's got and that. I got to tell you, man, just a sweetheart of a guy. He was great. We had so much fun getting together. Mm -hmm. It just was great to see everybody, you know, and get together. I missed the shoot. I was there one day and came down the plane and came back because I had to have back surgery and I was trying to put it off, but there weren't enough drugs they could put in to me. To yeah. do. I was in such pain. And the only way you could sleep was like a horse leaning up against a wall. You couldn't lie down. You couldn't sit down. And I just couldn't put it. And I told Tom Grace, I got to go back to Long Beach. I was there one day, got on the plane and called my dog. And said, I'm coming back. Let's get this done. And so... You know, that's that's how that went for me, which is a real bummer. But well, shit I mean, happens. It, it does. I'm glad. Uh, hopefully you're doing at least a little bit better than what you oh, were. Yeah, no, I'm good. I'm six feet shorter, but that's all right. I'm actually standing right now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, Bobby, I'm going to go ahead and let you come in. It's been fantastic. Hey, buddy. Uh, thank you so much. Um, if thank there's you. anything you can say to the turtle fans, what would you say? I just say thank you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I, I, I say that for everybody. Thank you. Uh, keep the faith. Uh, keep pushing forward with us. And uh, hopefully you'll learn something good from the turtle. It's this turtle world. And uh, just make the most of your life. Every breath is precious, y'all. So just enjoy it. And cowabunga dudes and dudettes, from my home to yours. I couldn't have said it or wrapped it up any better. He's been Bobby. I've been Julian. This has been... What's in my head podcast, and we are out of time. Bobby, thank you again. You have a great day out there. Hey, buddy, have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye. This podcast was presented by the Epic Sewers Podcast Network, the home of all your pop culture podcast needs. With shows like Epic Tales, Epic Tales from the Sewer, the Spoiler Force Podcast, Creator Con Q&A, Comic Watchers, and the What's in My Head Podcast. Follow us on this journey and get down and nerdy 